Fountainhead Forum 13, I have Norma Jean Almodovar, who is author of a book called From Cop to Call Girl. Yes, she has worked in the, for the L.A. Police Department, and she's also worked in the uh, oldest profession. So how are you doing, Norma Jean? Uh, kind of harried. Lots going on. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me about how you ended up in both of these professions and what your journey was? Uh, well, I can do it very quickly. Let's see. I was... Um, 18, I came to California. I needed to get a job. I had one job and then and I married Mr. Almodovar, my first husband, um, and I divorced him. But in the meantime, he needed a job. So he had filed a, an application for the LAPD, but he was already working as a carpenter. So I filled it out. I got the job. Just bad luck, bad timing. So, you know, um, so I spent 10 years working there and in the beginning, of course, I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I'm working for the LAPD, such a you know, wonderful organization. But as the years passed and I began to see the corruption that was occurring within the LAPD from the top down, um, I, was, I became very disillusioned. And by the time I had my third on-duty traffic accident, because I worked nights, I worked traffic because I was... Back in the 70s, 1972, when I joined, um, women were not hired as police officers. And so I worked as a civilian traffic officer, but they assigned me at night because they were contemplating having women become police officers. And they wanted to see whether or not I survived. So I was a guinea pig. And um, so, I mean, it was kind of dangerous there at night, but I, I saw a lot of things that I really, really regret seeing within the department. And I saw just so many crimes and homicides and, oh, God. Yeah. But um, anyway, so by the time 10 years came by and I had my third on-duty traffic accident, I decided I wasn't going to go back to work. And I had met a call girl, actually, when I was working on the LAPD at nighttime. She had pulled me over in her Porsche. I was in my patrol car. And she asked me to follow her home because she was being chased by somebody. So I did. And I'm like, I was looking at her life. She lived in this beautiful house up off of Hollywood Boulevard, up in the hills. And she had nail polish on which of course i didn't have i didn't have I, my nails were i bit my nails back then and, excuse me and um i asked her what she did and she told me she was a call girl and i was like wow you know why would she tell me but then of course i knew there were cops who were running call girl rings among other things so why would she be afraid to tell me you know so, so when i decided not to go back to work on the LAPD, I went to her and I asked her if she could introduce me to the madam she worked for, which she did. And um, I saw my first client and I was like, my God, I've been, can I swear on your show? Yeah, go ahead. I, I was fucking all the cops and they were terribly bad in bed. I mean, I used to say this and it's very true. Cops think making love is like using their gun. All they have to do is take aim and shoot. And then they can't get it out of the holster before it goes off. And that was very true. So here I am, you know, going to work. And I might as well, if I'm going to have sex with a lot of people, I might as well get paid for it. And believe me, the pay was so much better. And the clients that I saw were so much nicer than the cops I used to see for free. Yeah. And um, it just... The, I, I really liked working as a call girl. And as I often say, it was the best job I ever had. I mean, I made a lot of money. Um, I enjoyed the clients. I had some very famous clients whose names I will not disclose. Um, but it was, it was a really good job. Now, my problem was that uh, I was still suffering emotionally from the LAPD experience and I was seeing a therapist and I told the therapist how angry I was and you know I wanted to try to, to get rid of this anger and he suggested that I go to somebody that I knew on the LAPD that I didn't have a problem with that I didn't think was corrupt and it turns out that there was a woman named who 
had been, she was a traffic officer too. And she had been sort of my friend. I didn't really make a lot of friends in the LAPD, but we were sort of friends. And um, we had lunch and I told her about my new life and how much better it was and how much happier I was. And she said, Gee, Norma Jean, you know, I've always fantasized about being a call girl. If I was young and attractive, I'd make a million dollars. But she was not young. She was 50 years old and she weighed about 250 pounds, which is not desirable for work as a call girl. And I said, if I ever find a client that likes your type, I'd be happy to let you know. And so I had a client who happened to be the cousin of our then governor. And he liked taller, older women than me. And, you know, I'm 5'4 and like 5'10 or something like that. And she was 50 years old. I was in my 30s. So I thought, gee, I can, I can kill two birds with one stone. I can have my client see my friend. She can experience what it's like and everybody will be happy. So I called her to tell her about this potential date. Unfortunately for me, in California, when you try to arrange a date that involves money and sex, it's called pandering. And in California, it carries a mandatory three to six years on the first offense with no prior convictions. But if you commit rape, robbery, assault, mayhem, and murder, and you don't use a gun, you can get probation. You try to get somebody laid for money and you say words and only words you got to go to prison for three to six years. Well, I didn't know that, of course. Um, so she was unfortunately setting me up. And the reason she set me up is because of, she said she, did, she didn't want me to write a book about police corruption. Excuse me, I got to get a sip of water. So she <clears throat> arranged, she went ahead and we arranged the date. But instead of the date happening, um, the cops showed up and charged me with one count of pandering. Ten cops with their guns drawn came into my apartment and took me away, charged me with one count of pandering. Now, to make a very long story short, um, the cops basically said if I would stop going on, on TV and if I would stop writing the book, they would drop the whole thing. And I'm like, fuck yes. no, <laughs> I'm writing a book. It's called Cop to Call Girl. And I'm going to talk about the corruption. And uh, so anyway, I was convicted of one count of pandering because my attorney decided not to bother to defend me. So upon opening statement, he, he waived the opening statement and then he rested. End of my trial, excuse me. <clears throat> So I was convicted of one count of pandering, and the judge in 1984, in fact, today is the 20th of November, on November um, 19th of 1984, um, well, I, on the 18th, on the 19th, my husband and I got married because they said he couldn't come visit me if we weren't married. And so on the 20th, I went down to court. And I was sent off to prison for a psychiatric evaluation to see whether or not I was dangerous to society. And I was held in solitary confinement for 50 days. And the end result was that I wasn't a danger to anyone. So the judge, bless his heart, decided to give me probation despite the mandatory sentence. So I was on probation and I kept going on talk shows. I mean, because, you know, it was an unusual situation that somebody from the LAPD becomes a call girl and writing a book and, and all of that. And by the way, all the manuscript that I had been working on on the book, the police had confiscated when they arrested me. So now, <coughs> excuse me, now I had to rewrite the book and all the notes and everything that I had. I had to start all over again with the book, but I wasn't going to stop the book. So after I had spent two years and seven months on probation with no violations, the appellate court overturned my probation because the DA said I needed to go to prison because I was, quote, 
commercially exploiting my law enforcement past to draw on scandalous escapades that undermine respect for the law. Therefore, Norma Jean Amadova needs to serve the mandatory three to six years. So the appellate court overturned my sentence and I was remanded to custody again after I ran for Lieutenant Governor of California in 1986 because I said, I haven't been loud enough, obviously, so I'm going to get louder. So I ran for Lieutenant Governor and I got over 100,000 votes and I got a lot more publicity and that pissed off the LAPD even more. So um, anyway, I was, uh, the, the court overturned my probation and I was resentenced to three years in state prison of which I did 18 months because on, on a sentence you get half time if you behave yourself. So while I was in prison, fortunately, 60 Minutes came in to prison to interview me. And I believe that saved my life because otherwise, <coughs> excuse me, I was in with some pretty hardcore women like the Manson family women. My first roommate was a murderer. She killed her husband for the money. Um, Susan Atkins was on my dorm. Um, you know, I mean, there were a lot of very notorious women there that were very scary. But because 60 Minutes came in, <coughs> sorry, I believe that saved my life. That, and I did like 35 radio interviews from my dorm that really incensed the uh, LAPD. The cops were so mad. The DA was so annoyed because I kept saying, fuck you to them. Anyway, um, I went to work for a little at the end of a period of time and I was there for a few months. And one of the corrections officers attempted to rape me. And I turned him in and I was told, well, you know, it's your word against his and you're a convicted felon, so we don't believe you. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I got out of prison and the first thing I did was do another talk show. I went on Sally Jeffrey, Jesse Raphael's show and I talked about this corrections officer who had attempted to rape me while I was in my room alone. My roommate wasn't there. And um, when I got back, because that was in Florida, I came back to California. And um, then I was told that John Wells was transferred to work in an all-male prison. That's the extent of having attempted rape of an inmate. That's all it cost him was being transferred, which is very ironic because my crime was just words on trying to get my ugly friend laid. So yeah. the irony of it all. Anyway, so I was finally off parole and probation and everything else. And it took a few years and it wasn't until the Rodney King beating and the aftermath, the rioting that happened before a publisher, um, became interested in the book because everybody was terrified of Daryl Gates and they didn't want to cross cross him. So after the Rodney King beatings and all of the the aftermath of that, Simon and Schuster said yes and they published my book. So it was a long journey, but the book got published and now I'm writing a sequel. I'm writing pros and cons, postcards from prison. And it's about the prison experience with all those lovely ladies and the rapist cop, rapist CO, corrections officer. So see what trouble I can get in now. That's uh, interesting. Uh, did you see a lot of, was there a lot of chauvinism or misogyny on the police department? Did you oh, see? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course there was. I mean, but you got to understand, I've got eight brothers. And, you know, I come from a very large family. I was used to guys. So I, I, I mean, I was, I knew that that's what cops were like because my brothers were a lot like that too. So. Yeah. And, you know, I, and, you know, I, I, I suspect the, <clears throat> the uh, prison guards and female inmates things probably happens a lot more than people would like to admit. I, oh, yeah. no, it does. It power. Does. 
It does. You know, while I was incarcerated and not at work furlough, um, I had some really decent corrections officers who treated me with respect and dignity. Um, and, and I, you know, I point that out in the book that I'm working on now because it's like, no, not all of them are bad. Not all cops are bad. Unfortunately, they work for a corrupt agency and with the kind of laws that we have against drugs, gambling and prostitution, you are always going to have corruption until we decriminalize all of them. And I know people yeah. don't like to hear that, but I don't understand why people are willing to put up with police corruption, because what that means is that if you are the victim of a crime and the cops that arrest the suspect, if those cops are dirty, your suspect's going to get away and, yeah. and you won't get any justice. And I just don't understand why people can't understand that the, the, the cause and effect relationship of bad laws and bad cops. Yeah. I, I sometimes wonder if the Rodney King incident at least demystified police officers to a certain extent. Uh, and, and the fact that, and the fact now that so much of this stuff can get recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I, I can imagine those police officers who beat up Rodney King were not imagining that they're, that that would ever get on videotape. And oh, really, no, no, no. oh, wow. <laughs> they certainly did not expect that to happen. You know, and, you know, if you think about something like, you know, the move incident in Philadelphia, which has no video as far as I know. And, and nowadays, and nowadays there were, there would be videos everywhere of something like that, you know? Or, oh yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's a, it's really a, I, I, I sometimes, I don't know if there's more police brutality now, or if it's just more of it's getting recorded. That's one more thing. More it's getting recorded, but the, the, the brutality yeah. has always been there. I mean, it's unfortunate, you know, I, I saw yeah. a lot of it. One night I was called to direct traffic over the Hollywood freeway because some guy, quote unquote, um, had jumped off the freeway or jumped off the overpass onto the freeway. And of course he died. And, um, I got back to the police station, you know, to turn in, get my paperwork done uh, after I directed traffic and stopped everybody from getting on the freeway. And the sergeant and the other officer who was at the scene were in there laughing at, oh, the poor guy jumped. Basically he committed suicide by cop. And I knew it. And I mean, I couldn't prove it, obviously, because I hadn't been there when that happened. I got there after the fact. And I just, it just, <sighs> that they get away with it. And again, the good cops have to look the other way because you can't survive working for the LAPD or any other department knowing what you know. And you know, saying anything about it. So you got to keep your mouth shut. So. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed. Uh, yeah, yeah, did you think about going elsewhere? I mean, uh, you know, like going to a different city or say going no, to a different no, town no. or something like that. No, 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 no. I mean, I've lived in Los Angeles since I was 18 years old. I came out here. I was going to go to Philadelphia College of the Bible back when I was a Christian. And, um, but I came to California and I decided to stay. And that's when I met Mr. Amadovar. And so, no, I, I had no idea of, of going to any other department. Once I saw corruption and I realized it is, this, it is the consequence of enforcing bad laws that yeah. these cops become corrupt. And it would be the same anywhere because the laws are everywhere. Those kind of laws, drugs, gambling, prostitution. Yeah, uh, you know, and I and I think I think the Ill illegality of these things just yeah. Bad laws create bad, you know. Bad uh, cops. That's bad what cops. my slogan is: bad laws create bad cops. And and you know also, I I think also that that bad illegality probably makes prostitution a lot more dangerous than it needs to be because. Yeah. I'm getting the impression that it's. You know, you know, I mean, you don't see many women, you know, as lumberjacks or fishermen, which are some of the most dangerous jobs out there. But I, I imagine for women, this is probably one of the most dangerous jobs that that predominantly women do. What, sex work? Yes. 
It, I mean, unless you're working on the street, which of course I would never work on the street since I'd been on the street on the LAPD. And I was like, yeah. never again. I mean, working as a call girl, I worked strictly through madams. Um, once I had seen a client uh, a first time and he wanted to see me again, then he was my client. So I was able to have a lot of my own clients and it, I knew who they were. I knew where they lived. I knew where they worked. And there's an awful lot of other sex workers who have the same kind of situation. Street work is very dangerous. But then working on the street in any capacity, police work, street work is dangerous. Um, but when you're not working on the street and you're able to verify the clients, you're able to verify the people you work for, if you're working for an agency, um, you know, that, then that's not dangerous. It really isn't dangerous. But, I mean, it needs to be decriminalized, but it still isn't as yeah, dangerous yeah. as you would think. And it's certainly not as dangerous as working for the LAPD. So, Well, there's certainly a lot more jobs that are more dangerous than being a police officer, too, though. Uh, <laughs> But, but uh, sex work isn't one of them unless you work yeah. on the street. And, you know, it would be lovely to see people not have to work on the street. But understandably, there's a lot of people in the sex industry who work on the street. There's Some of them actually prefer working on the street. I know I have a friend that works in London. And she's, she's a college graduate. Um, she's got degrees. She's a very intelligent woman. But she enjoyed the kind of work working on the street because it, it at nighttime she felt more empowered, which if that's what ha helped her do her work, I don't care. I mean, yeah. who am I to condemn her way of working? Uh, did you, did you see a lot of uh, women who were in sex work who really didn't want to be in sex work? And, and no, no, that, I didn't. Enough. That. I know there's people who don't want to do sex work and they shouldn't have to do sex work if they don't want to. Yeah. If they have well, those uh, alleged pimps, uh, traffickers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I, I mean, I think a lot of, uh, I mean, there are a lot of women who don't want to do sex work, but it's the only way they can make money. But literally ones who are, who are not in, in it literally. And, you know, they were trafficked or whatever. I, I don't know if that happens in America. Maybe it happens elsewhere. Well, if there's, okay. What I started doing, because this is something that's very important for me. I, I started doing the math on the numbers that the FBI yeah. posts versus what the claims are. I mean, people say there's a hundred thousand or 300,000 children being trafficked into prostitution every year. Well, I looked up the statistics over long periods of time from the FBI. And that's just not true. And and if you go to my, my website, Police, Prostitution, and Politics, you can find all the statistics going back years. I mean, there are far, far, far more women who are victims of domestic violence um, and, and, and rape, date rape, then there are victims of sex trafficking. So this whole sex, and this is another thing, this is something I've been working on. What do these rabid abolitionists make for their crusade against sex trafficking? Um, well, with the few number that I could find is I go to GuideStar. And you, when GuideStar is a place where all nonprofits, and I have a nonprofit, so I know that's where mine, mine can be listed. You look up um, organizations that work on sex trafficking or human trafficking. These people in the, in the few that I was able to access without having to pay $2,000 a year, um, there's like six or seven billion dollars a year that these organizations rake in to rescue the non-existent, non-existent victims of sex trafficking. I mean, it's just, it, it's mind boggling how much money is in it and the salaries they pay themselves. As the head of a nonprofit organization myself, I have never been paid one penny for my work. Um, in fact, it's cost me a lot of money. I mean, I, I raise, I'm able to raise money to pay for the things, you know, for the office equipment and everything else that I have. But as far as getting paid for my work, I've never been paid. But these people are making 
in salaries, half a million dollars a year. Yeah. I mean, it's a good living, but it's all a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Is, is there, yeah. yeah. Is there a, I don't know, I'd say a pipeline from stripping to prostitution or, or not. I don't know if you'd call it a pipeline. Yeah. I think, I think if you're doing stripping and everything else, you will have private clients yeah. who you're willing to see and they pay you. I mean, yeah. who can blame them? I mean, you know, you got, yeah. you only make X number of dollars doing stripping. So, yeah, but I know, but I know there's some women who, who, who strip who probably wouldn't consider prostitution, but I, no, there was, and, 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 and that can be, that can be pretty well off too, but I've also known some women who actually didn't make that much money doing it. You know, it's a yeah. Well, I mean, it just it just depends on on where you live, on who the people yeah. you work for, the clients they have. I mean, you know, I had a client. His fantasy was that he was a, a woman. Okay, and my job was to dress him up in women's clothes. I was there from like eight o'clock at night till six or seven in the morning. I never had sex with him. I put makeup on him. I put him in women's clothes. <clears throat> I made $10,000. Wow. Yep. I, I suppose LA is probably got some of the biggest ticket clients you'll find anywhere. I bet. Probably. And a lot of yeah. actors. I had some yeah. very, very famous clients. And, and and maybe athletes as well. Yes. I didn't have any athletes. No, 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 that's not true. I had a, a um, Russian ballerina client. So oh wow. That's that's, a, that's athletic. So. Yeah, I don't know. Is it a guy? What's the What's the main reason why uh, men? I assume it was mostly men. What's the main reason why men go to prostitutes? Uh, because they want to fulfill a fantasy. Um, okay. I had I had not just men. I had men and couples and women clients. Okay. Um, and the majority of them are the one they want to fulfill a fantasy that perhaps their spouse or girlfriend doesn't want to do. Um, like the like the client that liked to cross dress. I mean that yeah. his wife wasn't into that. Um, there's also a lot of clients who want a threesome with their wife or their with their girlfriend um, or with another call girl. So, I mean, there's a lot yeah. of very, very interesting fantasies out there. Uh, I can imagine that. You know, that clients just, that, that's what they want to try. They're not in any way dangerous uh, and, and you get paid good money for it. So. Yeah, that's what I can imagine. So it's, so do you do you think there's an eight? I mean, how, how, what's uh, what do you think gets uh, wh how, how what's the how long does a a, a a prostitute usually stay in the in the field? Uh, five years, ten years? And it just depends. I mean, I've had women friends that have been in the business from the time they're in their twenties to the time they're in their fifties, because it's a good job, and you you yeah. develop a list of your own clients and you see them whenever you need money and you know why not i mean if the client's still willing to see you yeah so it, it sounds like a lot of your work came from regulars then yes it did and that that's the best part is like working for a madam you know the, yeah. the ma madams that i worked for they would want a, a percentage of your income for like two three or four times depending upon how much money the client normally paid. Um, and it was a 60, 40 split. So, you know, after that, if the client wanted to see you regularly, then whatever you made was yours. So, and I pay taxes on it. I, I hate that I had to, but I didn't want to get in trouble with the IRS since I, you know, <laughs> getting in trouble with the police was enough. Wow, that's, that's so you actually paid your taxes on it. That's interesting. IRS doesn't care how you make your money. Yeah, I, I figure there's probably I figure though there's probably a lot of a lot of the business probably is conducted in cash. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, and and I know nowadays uh, some of them are are getting into Bitcoin too. Uh, yeah, 
obviously Bitcoin wasn't around back then, but no, it certainly wasn't. But yeah, no, it's just um, you know, if you want to buy anything, property or anything else, you have to show where your money comes from. Yeah. And you have to have taxes and things like that. So do you think we'll ever get to a point where there is no demand for prostitution? No, it will never get to that point. <laughs> Because people, men will always desire it more than women do, I guess. No, or? because because human nature is such that men and women, because don't forget I had women clients too, uh, and couples. Yeah. There's always an interest for trying something new. Yeah. And you know, couples want to do that just as much as, as single clients. So I, I can't imagine that it will ever stop. Yeah. There will always be women like me and men. Of course, there's male sex workers. Yeah. And well, what did the women want? Hmm? What were the women usually looking for? As clients? Yeah. They wanted to explore bisexuality or lesbianism. And, uh, you know, the same if it was a couple. The woman wanted to explore that part of her while the while the husband watched. Well, it was a safe place for her to experience something with another woman. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, so. That's certainly uh, interesting how that works out. Uh, what? So, how how long were you in the in the business? On and off, I mean, before I went to prison, then yeah. not right after I went to, you know, got out, but for, for a while. I mean, but, you know, I just, I became so busy with the book and, and writing, doing my nonprofit. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an awfully long time after my book came out. So. Yeah. What, what do you think of the, the, the modern feminist movement now? It seems like there's a lot of cases where feminists are really coming out against prostitution, saying all oh, prostitution. Oh, yes. yes, all of us are victims. We're all, yeah. uh, you know, we, we, we don't know we're victims. We have to be rescued. It's just such utter bullshit. It's like, what happened to the feminists that said, it's your body, it's your choice? What happened to that, the fact that women, adults, not children, not minors, but adult women get to choose what they will and will not do with their own body, whether it's an abortion, whatever it is, it's their body, it's their choice. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot more inf infantilization among women in, in, uh, in the feminist movement now. That yes, they... there certainly is. And, and we go up against them all the time. I mean, they're just, I was a delegate to the women's conference in China back in the 80s. And um, one of the things, you know, because the, the, the feminists say that all pornography and prostitution are incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and must be eliminated. So in China, there were five of us from various parts in different countries to counter that radical feminist bullshit. And um, we were able to change the platform for action. The platform for action is something that they do supposedly every 10 years. They haven't done it since we did that one in the 80s, but um, it's supposed to lay out what the, excuse me, what, what should be done to help women. So the platform for action, we actually changed by one word. They were saying in the platform for action, all prostitution is incompatible with the dignity and worth of the human person and must be eliminated. We got the word inserted all forced prostitution, which was a major accomplishment because, yeah, if it's forced, then of course you don't want to have that. Happen. Yeah. But then they changed the rules. They said, no, all prostitution is forced. And we're like, no, you're taking away the rights of women who do not feel the same as you. And you have absolutely no right to tell yeah. us that we're forced. So, so it's been one of those things we've been fighting. I mean, there's radical feminists and you have you have um, these, these, in fact, one of them, Melissa Farley was over there and she kept telling us, no, you don't, women don't understand, you're victims. Yeah, it sounds like to me, prostitutes get more criticism from women than they do from men. <coughs> yes, but the men are the ones usually that make the rules. 
Yeah, and, was. and and you're and you're now getting criticism, you know, on one side from the religious prudes, <laughs> and on the other side you have this different kind of puritanism. Puritanism, although yep. a, a lot of these lefty mm -hmm. academics are probably secular, if not outright atheist. Yeah, uh, it's it's rather interesting to see how it's coming down on both sides. Uh, I know. That's that's why it's it's been a long long haul. You know, I thought by now <clears throat> we would make some progress in getting the laws changed. But so far, the radical left and the radical right have beaten yeah. down all our attempts. And you and you were really, uh, you know, you were really down on uh, SESTA and... SESTA, <coughs> SESTA, oh, it's hideous. It's really, yeah. it's harmed so many sex workers. And it's just, well, it's hideous. Well, the biggest thing too is it, it you know, the Craigslist, uh, you know, killed their personal section because of that. Yep. Uh, because they didn't want to be implicated because for no, whatever they didn't. Reason, didn't. They didn't at all. Yeah, they, they just nuked it. It's, uh, yep. uh, and then that was, you know, one of, I think one of Trump's worst legacies, although it doesn't get <laughs> talked about much. Well, if you knew where Trump got all of his wives, you would wonder why he would allow that. You that should, doesn't shock you me. Should look up, uh, you should look up Sydney Biddle, Biddle Barrels, the Mayflower Madam, and um, see yeah. the picture of her with Ivana. Yeah. And I, yeah. Like, I keep in touch with all my girls. You take it from there and figure out what whatever that means. Yes, indeed. I... And, and, and the same for the other two. Yeah, is there also a crossover, say, between the porn industry and prostitution, or is it of mostly? Course. Yeah, of okay. Was it is. Industry, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I I have a lot of friends in the porn industry. Um, my husband and I were the first ones to file a lawsuit to overturn the laws against porn because what we wanted to do was to make uh, instruction videos, which would be pornographic, to help people have better sex lives. Unfortunately, um, our, our lawsuit was, this was before I went off to prison. Our lawsuit was considered moot. And then, um, then it, what's his name? I can't think of his name off the top of my head. His lawsuit, Hal Freeman, his lawsuit overturned the laws prohibiting pornography. But we were the first, so. Yeah, how do you? What do you think about how prostitution is portrayed in, say, movies? I mean, r risky business, for example, or or. Well, I mean, they got to make money, and then you know, everybody is like interested in this issue. Everybody is like, oh, prostitutes. I mean, we're we're like this exotic yeah. thing. Let's 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 show them, but let's let's not let them actually real women do it. Let's not let that happen. Yeah. Or, or even, or even say a movie like *Indecent Proposal*. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, just, I mean, if you knew the producers in Hollywood, I mean, they have such a fascination with prostitutes because they're probably clients. <laughs> I knew several very major producers who were my clients. I, I can imagine. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, even though it's bad, not good in America, uh, have you talked to any women, uh, you know, in places where it's a lot worse, like Iran or some of these other countries? I mean, I mean, you know, I'm part of the international movement for decriminalizing prostitution. So I'm in touch and contact with a lot of organizations, a lot of activists. I mean, of course, New Zealand managed to decriminalize consenting adult commercial sex. And, and they're not having any issues with trafficking. Um, and it's just, and Australia is more or less quasi decriminalized. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I work with people around the world because this is, you know, thank goodness for the internet. We have access to each other all over the world. So I know everybody, they all know me. Um, they all know the different other players in this fight to decriminalize. So, yeah. You know, but I mean, as far as like the countries in Iran and places like that, we don't have much access to them. I'm sure because they don't have much access to the internet. So, 
Yes, of course. I. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me wonder, does it, is it more lucrative to, say, be a bilingual prostitute or even to have three or four dot languages? Or Sure. Now, of course, it would be very helpful, especially if you like to travel. And there's a lot of sex workers who, that's their whole thing, is <clears throat> they get to travel around the world and see different clients here and clients there and, and get to see the world, which is, you know, a very interesting place. Yeah, does that ever happen? Like, you, know, you, you might get a client who says, say, hey, I'm... I'm going to go, you know, vacation in Puerto Vallarta for a week. Will you be my escort for the whole week? And you, I didn't have any who did that, but there's a lot of them who do. Yes. See, I, I wouldn't go away. I, I, I hate to be away from my husband. Yeah. You know, after prison, I'm like, nah, I don't yeah. want to be away. And I mean, in some cases, you know, too, they might just want to have a woman, you know, who goes to, goes with them to dinner and stuff like that, you know? Yes. That's very often happens. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's always about sex, you know, it's a, it's not, yeah, it's not about always about sex. <clears throat> it just, just looks better. If, you show, if you're going to some business meeting, you've got your attractive girlfriend with you. It just seems to, I, I think men do tend to respect yep. women who do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I had, I had a very famous client after yep. who used to take me and the other woman that we used to play with uh, out to dinner all the time. And I was like, I was already on lots of talk shows, so everybody knew basically yeah. who I was and what he was doing with us. And he didn't care. But, and it was and it was fun. I mean, because he was he was a fun guy. So you've been married to this. So this guy's your second husband. You've been married to him for thirty eight years. Yep, we've been together for forty seven years. Wow. So, so I met him when I was on the LAPD. Yeah. So this hasn't really, uh, you know, put a damper on anything. It's a, uh, your, your <laughs> marriage has been fine. He's okay with it's it. It's been fine. I've brought my friends home for us to play with and he's enjoyed that. So, yeah. So what, uh, do you have, what, you know, I, I'm done to ask, what do you think about 50 shades? Why is 50 shades popular? You know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm totally not into bondage and all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I had a client who was, but actually, um, I was the one who tied him up. And, oh. you know, <laughs> I I had a really difficult time yeah. spanking him because I'm not into violence. But that's yeah. that's what he was into. I've heard that. I've heard that's actually even more lucrative for uh, femdoms make more money. But I don't. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of guys that are into that. It just yeah. it just doesn't. I really only had a couple of clients that were into that. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't want to see clients that needed to be spanked or tied up. I'm just like, no. Yeah. And of course I would not ever allow myself to be tied up. Yeah. So. I think there's a sense for some guys, you know, they just feel like I can't do anything, you know, and, you know, some people may just like to be tied up and be tickled too, you know, it's, they do. Yes. I mean, and then it's like, Whatever tickles your fancy is what I oh, say. Yeah. I mean, unless you do harm to somebody else, I mean, really harm against the other person's will and consent, oh, yeah. then whatever, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a yeah. lot of interesting boats out there. Mm -hmm. so. Do you have any uh, any opinions on what's happening right now with the? Because it seems like right now we have a lot of men and women in our society who aren't very happy. I mean, you know, never married women who, who, who it, it seems, you know, are, are, I mean, with so many women on psychoactive drugs and we have a lot of men out there who aren't happy either. I mean, what, what do you think is the solution to all this or how do we <laughs> get back get to this? Laid more often. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, <sighs> Religion has instilled so much guilt on yeah. people for sex. And I think that a lot of people's attitude is like, well, if I do this, then I'm going to go to hell. And it's a bad thing. And it's like, you know what? As long as you don't hurt someone that doesn't want to be hurt, because there's, you know, some people that like pain. Um why not yeah your life it's all you got as far as yeah. you know, we don't know that there's an afterlife i mean there's people who believe that but even so this is what you get go out and have fun enjoy your yeah. life laugh 
Have yeah. orgasms. Lots of them. Yeah, because I hear I hear that's you know why why some of the more religious people tend to get married younger is because oh now we're married we can you know have fun, you know and they weren't you know they're not allowed because they're not allowed to have it before they're yeah. married. And that's a shame, you know. Yeah. I mean, having an orgasm as I mean, see, yes. women aren't supposed to be orgasmic, but we are. And um, I enjoy my body. I enjoyed what my husband could do to it. I enjoyed what other women could do to it. I enjoyed when, when my clients, I mean, I, my policy was not to have an orgasm with a client because I was there for him, not for me. If we were with another woman, that was a different thing or with his wife, whatever. But, um, you know, orgasms are like, they, they really are so good for your mental health, your physical health, why we don't all want them every day, I don't know. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if they're doing if, they, if anybody's out there doing studies, you know, on what the effect of is of not having sex. I can. I'm sure there's how it can be good. It's. Uh, I'm sure, there's people out there doing the research on it, but you know. Yeah. Have you have you read anybody like you know Ken Ken Kinsey or you know the or the the Kinsey Institute or you know some of the those Kinsey other Institute. You know, and some of those other people who, uh, you know, who've written, who've become, yeah. you know, sex experts, so to speak. I mean, I don't know, Margaret well, I, Mead and. Yeah, I well, I, you know, I, I used to go up and speak to the uh, Sex Institute up in San Francisco um, and talk about it. I mean, I've lectured at colleges and universities and, you know, women's groups about human sexuality, about the positive benefits of enjoying sex because there's so many really positive benefits of having orgasms. Yeah. You know, it releases oxytocin and all these other good things in your body and, and it makes your body feel really good. And, th and then it makes your day really good. And when you go off to work, your day is happier because you're not like <laughs> with your fellow workers. Yes. So. Well, uh, you didn't have any kids, did you? Uh, no. I have eight brothers and five sisters. I was the first girl. I raised 10 kids. That's enough for any woman to have to raise. Oh, eight brothers. So, you, so you're one of 14. Oh, yes. wow. First girl, fourth down, three boys, then me. So, so you really, so you really gained an understanding. What, what are all your, what are all your siblings think of this? Well, I mean, they all love me. There's none of them have disowned me. And when my mom and I went on Sally, Jesse, Raphael show together, and my mom says, how do you deal with your daughter being a whore? And my mom, who's a fundamental, who she passed away years ago. She said, well, she hasn't made any worse choices than my other children. And besides that's God's job to judge her, not mine. So. Wow. I know. Very enlightened mother. Are some women in sex work maybe rebelling against their their uh, 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 a rather Christian, rather puritanical upbringing or not? Or do you think that's it's possible? All, all that's what they're doing. I don't know. I mean, I don't know the reasoning behind why every woman or man get into sex work. I just know that the people that I have known, especially those, I mean, I particularly have been hanging out with the sex worker rights activists. You know, one of my dearest friends just passed away three days ago, Carol Lee. She was the, she was the one who coined the term sex work. And um, she, she was a major player in the decriminalization effort. I mean, we've been friends for so many years and, you know, I just, I don't know the people that have issues with being sex workers. I don't know them. I've not met them. Yeah. Do you do you think we'll ever? It, it seems like sex work has been, you know, at least que the law has tried to eliminate it forever, and it's always failed. Yes, it has. Do you always think failed. We'll ever get to a point where they'll just throw up their hands and say, "Okay." prostitution is here. We're always going to have prostitution. We can't get rid of it. I would hope they do. I mean, that's been my goal. And for all the work that I do as, you know, as a sex worker rights activist is hope that we can educate the people who pass the laws, who can 
decriminalize sex work. I mean, because it really, I mean, they've got to get over worrying about what other people think of them and, and say, look, you know what? We would prefer that people be able to do this willingly and, and those that are victims of crimes have access to law enforcement and, and services and everything else so that they don't have to do sex work. Then, then we want to continue to criminalize sex work where everybody's a criminal and we don't know who needs help and who doesn't. I hope we grow. Yes. That's my biggest hope is grow the fuck up. And maybe you'll end up, you know, you end up with some kind of unionization too. I don't know if there's any going to move to do that. Yeah, you know? I'm not a union joiner, and I, I think there's a lot of people that. I mean, it's like you join a union. It, there's all kinds of things that you have to do. I mean, there's there's people that want to join unions, and if they want to, that's fine. If they want to put together a union, great. But I think the majority of people in sex work like to like the work because they can do it when they want. They don't have yeah. to like abide by certain union rules. Yeah, well, so you know, we're very independent you know, thinkers. You know, something like this. You know, some unions have take all. You know, something more like the Screen Actors Guild, though. For example, you know, I mean, SAG. For example, you can get your health insurance through SAG. You know, that's and and unions can't have some benefits with that. So that's yeah, they can. But I think a lot of people in the sex sex industry are just too independent to want to want to be confined by somebody else's rules for what you will and will not do. Yeah. yeah. So I know I am. Who, have been, who, in, who in the political world have been some of the great allies of the of, of sex work? Of course, the Libertarian Party is one, but are yes, there any others? They have been. I mean, they have been up until the latest infiltration of the Libertarian Party by the Mises Caucus. The Mises Caucus, yeah. Yeah, Mises Caucus, whatever. I call them mice because they're mice. But yeah, no, I, I, I think, uh, think women like me. I mean, we just we're free thinkers. We like to do our own thing. And and what's wrong with that? Yeah, definitely the case. I mean, I, I wonder how how this is all going to go. Uh, uh, was the profession harmed uh, any by the recent events since uh, March, since early 2020? So, what do you mean has it been harmed by? Well, uh, the big bad virus and things like that. Oh, with COVID, yeah, no, you know, when I became a sex worker, we learned how to protect ourselves from all kinds of things, from AIDS, from sexually transmitted diseases because it's in our best interest to maintain our health. And I think there's an awful lot of sex workers who were able to make the transition from physical contact, which is preferable, of course, to doing by internet and seeing their clients virtually, which is very safe. I yeah. mean, I mean, obviously street workers weren't, but I, th I think a lot of them still practice the same things that we practiced during the AIDS crisis and everything else. You know, just yeah. want to maintain your health. You don't want to get sick. You don't want to get a disease. You don't want to spread a disease. So, Yeah. What, what do you think about sites like OnlyFans? I think it's great. Yeah. I think, I think it offers a venue for so many people, male and female and trans people, to be able to sell sex without physical contact. So... Yeah, I mean, I sometimes I wonder if these people are just looking for the companionship and not necessarily looking for the sex, you know, it's a, yeah, a lot of it is just the companionship because you know what, there's an awful lot of very lonely people in the world, a lot of them. And think, yeah, uh, and and being able to spend time with another human being so that they can actually touch you physically, because you know, most times if you go out on a date and it's just a date, I mean, somebody might be reluctant to hug you or whatever. Um, I had a client who was in his late 80s, and he really couldn't have intercourse, but he just liked to have me over, and I would give him a back rub, and I would play with his penis. He wouldn't have an erection. He wouldn't have an orgasm, but he would. we would talk, and we would. he would tell me about the wife that died years before and how he missed her. 
You can't go out on a date with a girlfriend and talk about your deceased wife. You can't. So having someone who could hold him and touch him and massage him and just comfort him was extremely important to him. Is it fair to say you're almost like a therapist? Yeah, I'd say. I mean, we don't have a degree, but we certainly learn a lot about human nature. Yeah, I, I can imagine what you learn about human psychology when you're doing this. Uh, yeah, yeah I, uh, it was the best job I ever had. I really enjoyed learning about people and learning about their sexuality. And, and as I learned and I was able to share my knowledge with them and help people who had hangups and who had difficulty dealing with life. And it was just, you know, for me, it was, it was therapeutic for me as well as my clients. And yeah. why it was therapeutic for me is because it helped me to heal from my anger. You can't be angry and hold someone and comfort them. You can't, you have to let it go. And that was possible for me so that I could see my clients and get paid. And, and it helped me overcome that anger I had yep. towards the LAPD, towards corrupt cops, towards prison and all of that so that I could function in society as a much more healed person than I was when I came home from prison and also before I left the LAPD. So Yeah, I, I think a lot of people end up finding healing when they are helping others heal. It's, yep. they do. I, I don't know, it's a way to, and you know, interesting way to let out your own anger because because you, you can't be angry at somebody when there's not when angry. you're trying to make him have an orgasm. You can't be yeah. angry with him. It doesn't work. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So well, it sounds like maybe I think we're maybe getting to be a good time to wrap up here then. So yeah, because uh, yeah, I got to get back to work. Interesting talk. Yeah. We're buying a house and I got to do all kinds of paperwork. Yeah, and so. you've got an and you've got an older and husband. I got to get my husband a shower. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Well, this has been a great chat. I. Uh, you know, I've. Uh, is there any anything you want to say or any websites you want to tell us about? Well, I can go to my. They can make donations. We're a five hundred one c three nonprofit. They can make a donation to my nonprofit organization, which help which helps keep me going. That's iswface.org. Um, iswface.org. Yeah, International Sex Worker Foundation for Art, Culture, and Education, because a lot of us are artists. And they can go to police, prostitution, and politics.com and see all kinds of statistics. And there's links to all kinds of other organizations. So. Oh, well, yeah. So that's uh, been very interesting. Well, this has certainly been a very interesting talk. I've loved having you on here. So, well, thank you, Chris. I I'm Chris it. Baker. At, my website is chrisbaker.net. You can get my novel, Escape from the Village. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye.